and uh, I feel balanced already listening to all of this. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Julie Esterly and she'll be speaking on new models of entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship, good business for the individual, the community and the entire planet. Dr. Julie Esterly has been uh, an integrative health practitioner for 40 years. A Sufi student for the same length of time, she leads classes, retreats and workshops in the United States and abroad. Currently, she is in a period of transition uh, in New York for the new cycle of her life and it includes social entrepreneurism. Judy. That was wonderful. So much life. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I, um, I want to thank uh, the Library of Alexandria and the Human Foundation for all the work that went into creating this gathering. It's a real honor to be here, and it's a, a blessing to be, I don't need my name, to, um, to be part of it, to be part of a group of people who have such a deep longing. I felt it in everyone who's spoken, this deep longing to create a better world and are taking action to do that. I wanted to, before I started uh, my talk, I wanted to ask how many people in this room are social entrepreneurs? Raise your hands. All right. And how many people know nothing about social entrepreneurism? Anybody? No? Okay. All right. I just wanted to have a sense of where, where people were in the, their knowledge stream so that I could address it better. When I was a young girl, I had a grandmother named Nana Sabin, and my grandmother was a great mentor to me. She used to take us to the bank every week, and she would help us put money in the bank. She loved Christmas. It's a Christian holiday at the end of December, but really, what she loved was giving presents. The spiritual side of it wasn't that big for her, it was the presence. And so she took us every week to put a dollar into the bank, and it was a blessing that we had money to save. I realize in many parts of the world that wouldn't have been possible. <laughs> but we would put our dollar every week into the bank, and then at the end of the year, we had money to buy gifts for our families with. When she died in her 80s, it was 30 years ago, we um, found that she had savings accounts for us, all of the grandchildren, all over town in different banks. And we had to go on like a treasure hunt to find the different accounts. And one of the accounts was for a child that wasn't yet born. My sister's daughter, she wasn't even born and yet she was already saving for her. In our time, <laughs> in our time, what is the legacy? What are the gifts that we are giving our children, our unborn children? Very sadly, it is almost certain that our unborn children's immune systems are compromised irretrievably. For those of you who don't know what an immune system is, most of you do, but just in case, in case you don't, it's the part in our bodies that protects and fights infection that helps us be able to survive in the world. And so if our legacy to our children is that theirs are compromised before they're even born, we're in big trouble. We're in big trouble. So, in 1993, a man named Paul Hawken wrote a beautiful book called The Economy of Commerce. And 
In it, he said, well, by the way, the immune systems are compromised because of toxins in the water, the air, the food, and um, business has a great deal to do with that, a great deal. He wrote this book and he said, this is in 1993, there's no polite way to say the truth that business is destroying the world. It's true. It was true. It continues to be true. At that time, he said the Western peoples, the Western world, now it's much more around the world, are, um, we, are we have the hubris to think that we can outfox human nature. Does that word make sense to you? Outfox? You know what that word is? So we know now, completely know, this is impossible to outfox human nature. And we see it around us in our weather, we see it in our lives, in our health, we see it everywhere. So the business has this ability to be such a force for um, trauma and de de destruction, then it can also be a force for positive change. And that's what the ideal of social entrepreneurism offers. For those of you who don't know, social entrepreneurism is business, and it's also called social enterprise. Someone in our community of speakers, that's a word I've heard used here. It's called restorative commerce. It's called green business. It has a lot of different names. And like any uh, idea, some people adhere to it in a way that's very whole, and some people less so, Sorry. less so. But it's a business in which social, the social mission is embedded in the business itself. From the very beginning, every element, every aspect is includes the social mission. I want to um, read you a quote, but I have to look it up here. Let me see where it is. Just a second here. So the hope is that in this growing global movement that the businesses that are created will not only just not make damage, but will actually restore the damage that has happened. So a lot of the folks that have spoken here, and I really hope that some of you in our question period will be able to talk about the social enterprises that you're part of. Depends on the timing, I know. But the social impact um, that we're trying to work with in these businesses has certain qualities. One of the ways that I feel like women have um, something special to offer this, it's not, it's a duh to you all. It's not something that you don't know. But because women have this desire to protect, whether you've given birth or not, it's the human desire. None of us want to be having our children born already compromised. It's a human desire, but I think because women have a sensitive feeling, whether they've given birth or not, we're exactly the right people, exactly have the energies for social enterprise. It can take a number of forms. Some of them are very small. Some of them are very large. Some of them are in one country. Some of them in another country. And I think of it as applying heart and insight to the business of business. The movement isn't, isn't new. In fact, one of the people that came up in my um, looking at the, hist the history is, um, where is she? Dina Marie. Dina Marie's talk on Florence Nightingale. She was actually one of the early um, social entrepreneurs and today she talked about how many different things she had her finger in lots of pies and how many of them um, she influenced so I want to move on to um, some of the principles and
and I think of them, many of them are part of this restoring the feminine to the world, the feminine balance. Uh, one being that we take responsibility in a social entrepreneurial activity, we take responsibility for the environment. That from the time the product is made or the service is given, that there is a stream of awareness about the entire flow of what is happening. That means that in the end, that product will not harm the environment. If we're creating objects, they're durable, they last a long time, they're useful and utilitarian versus so many of the things that I least, they're so throwaway. Have you noticed? Everything you just <laughs> use at once, you know, razors, everything you use at once and you throw it away. And um, that's uh, not going to fly for the future of our planet. It doesn't require exotic financing. <laughs> And it was great because this was spoken about today, that women tend to not need huge amounts of money to start enterprises. That was a very good point. That women don't need these vast amounts of money or exotic, uh, unusual instruments to finance a housing bubble, to finance a crash of an economy. Let's see. And that the production processes are human, worthy, and intrinsically satisfying. People want to do good work. We all want to do work that supports ourselves and our family, but that has heart and soul to it. Who doesn't want to do that? Not very many people. We all want to do good work. And so that's part of the entire process, that that's woven into it. The poet and um, farmer Wendell Berry, an American, he said something that I found interesting. He said, however destructive may be the policies, the government, and, uh oh, my, it ate something. However may be the destructive may be the policies of the government, what we find is that it goes into how we live. It's about how we live, the choices that we make. And so, this thing of the business, all those same things must apply to our own life or will be useful to apply for our own life. He said, corporations and every problem that concerns us always comes back to our, our choices. There's no doubt about it by the greed of the rich and powerful, but there are not enough of them to consume the entire world. To do that, they need the help of countless ordinary people. We're the countless ordinary people, and our choices and our actions reflect, reflect that. <coughs> On the airplane to Cairo, I sat by a lovely Egyptian <coughs> woman, and we began talking. Her name was Dr. Eman Sorur. Would that be how I said? Eman Sorur. She was a psychiatrist, and she was working with the mentally ill and the arts. And um, she said, as has been mentioned here, that the mental health field is not very strong in Egypt. There aren't a lot of them. And so she was working for the ministry. Uh, what was she? She was director of international affairs for the mental health secretariat. But she resigned a few years ago to form an NGO because she felt like she could do more with an NGO. And um, she's been working with Italy. Italy's having a lot of uh, interaction with Egypt on some mental uh, health uh, programs. And so she's so excited because she started this thing that's going to open up soon, that they are working with uh, the mentally <coughs> ill. They created a center. And it's going to be held here in Alexandria. It's a workshop center where they're training the mentally ill to do mosaics and also training them to run their own center, the workshop. They'll run it themselves. You know, this is not huge, massive work, but the impact will be great for Egypt. And for her, she had so much enthusiasm for it. It was very inspiring. And then I went to Basata on the Sinai. And um, there, this is an eco-village that was started 30 years ago. Have any of you been there? Have you ever been? Yeah, several people have. Yeah. 
It's um, near uh, Nueva. And um, so I was doing some research. I was there four years ago, and I would like to bring a group to Egypt and then there for a retreat. And so I was there to just feel out what was going on. And I was talking to Sharif. Um, Sharif's last name is? Lamrawi. Someone say it? Lamrawi? Yes. Oh. Yes. And um, so we were talking about his mission and his goals. And he said that uh, we were talking also, and I showed him the program for this, uh, for this event. And he knew uh, someone on it. I think I spoke to her. He knew someone on it. She'd come as a child to Vasata. He's been there for 30 years, so he's, he's seen it for a long time. But what was very interesting was we were talking about uh, the World Economic Forum, which is primarily very big players, a lot of corporations, lots of big cheeses. He said, he said I'm a small cheese, but he, was, uh, he told me that this, they just started a social enterprise, social entrepreneur division, so that they are going to be promoting social entrepreneurism. And he was awarded the, uh, the World Economic Forum Social Entrepreneur Award in 2008. And he's also an Ashoka Fellow. And I don't know if, do many of you know about Ashoka? It's a great organization and one to really keep in the back of your mind if you have some projects that you are wanting to develop. They're doing a lot of education, a lot of funding, uh, very really, and he's, so he's also a fellow of that organization. And one of the groups that I just wanted to mention is called Solar Sisters. I love this name, Solar Sisters. And their, their values are sisterhood, trust, and grit. Do you know what that word is? Does that translate? Grit? Yes? Grit. No? What would be the word? Um, tough. Tough but not hard. Tough but not hard. Persistence? Yes, persistence. So that's part of their vision. And it's in three countries right now, Uganda, Tanzania, and Nigeria, but they're going to be expanding to other countries. And so it's a woman-centered sales network in which they um, bring clean energy and stoves uh, to rural Africa. They've got 2,000 women working in it. 300,000 people are being affected. They're cooking. And the woman who started it is um, won the World Economic Forum Social Entrepreneur Award for her work. It's a really, um, seems like it's growing very. So there are millions of examples of social entrepreneurs, much of them much smaller than these. The kinds of things that you were talking about. But they grow and they all come together. They all come together in a field of force and um, a field of power and a field of love and they spread out into the world. When I was preparing for this talk, I, um, I read a quote in the book. I, I uh, got the Kindle version of a force such as the world has never known. And it was Jean Shinoda Bolin. She wrote so aptly, when there are a critical number of empowered, aware women and I have to say, I feel like empowered, aware of men. I have no, uh, you know, it's the women who I think are going to do it. But we, I have to do it with the empowered, aware men also. When, then what can result is every woman wants for her own children what all children and what all children are entitled to have. This is a mother's agenda and all human beings' agenda. It is, if I can get there. Clean air to breathe. A simple thing which you in Egypt are really have to face. Those of you who live in Cairo, I think, are really amazingly strong people. That's a tough, beastly city. That is. It is. It is. 
they, a safe water to drink, a worldwide issue, which I know many of you are very aware of, how big of an issue safe drinking water is. Nourishing food. And this is a real uh, an issue of mine. We know there is enough food in the world. What is going on with the distribution? That a huge number of the, uh, the culture, cultures are overweight and other people do not have enough to, enough to eat. This is wrong and I think we can solve it. Universal education, access to excellent health care, we'll, uh, where all have opportunity to develop intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually. And spiritually where there's compassion and justice. And no one lives in fear of abuse or violence. Can we imagine such a world where women around the world are not living in fear of abuse and violence? So, this will depend upon women in circles reaching a tipping point, this is still her quote, to become the force such as the world has never known. So here we are. We're one of those circles, although we're staver in rows. We're one of those circles. We're part of this force for tipping. And that's what we hope for, is that it tips in this direction of greater humanity, of greater love. So may we bring our entire beings full-heartedly to this task. Thank you. Another great one, right? Yes. Um, and uh, we'll be able to ask them questions a little later on. But first we'll hear from Ulfa Tantawi. And she will now take us on a walk through the road of development. Transforming business, society and self. The power of empathy. Ulfa Tantawi is a development professional with more than 20 years experience in the field. Throughout her career with various international development organizations, Ulfa led different teams of professionals to design and implement social protection programs to interlink government with civil society and with the private sector, supporting small farmers' equitable success to high-value agri-food value chains. <laughs> 